Well, as a, before we get started, I'd like to point out that it is not my favorite doing funerals. It's just not my favorite event. So we need to consider everyone's life and why God put them there. But where does one start when one goes to describe Norm Bagshaw? Uh, joyful. Oh, he had that to him. Everyone's life has lessons and principles that um, can be passed down to others to help them have a good life and to appreciate what they do have, what they have been given. And we all develop what is called contact memories of people we've met or we know, you know acquaintances. And, uh, and sometimes they have a more of an effect on us than we realize. Well, Norm did have an effect on people. And he was not somebody you quickly forgot. <laughs> yeah, that, something about him. Well, you know, there's people we come across that create good memories for us. And others that uh, create memories that are very bitter and distasteful. we have to look at if they're creating that for us what are we creating in other people's lives you know, where are we setting boundaries of what we're doing to another person's life and where do you go with Norm? on this matter. Did he create good memories for you or bad ones? Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Again, everybody's different. Yeah. Do we talk of all the persecution he endured over the years? I don't know whether you realize that, but he did have a lot of areas where he was put down um, mainly because he did allow his children to learn to be individuals. And that bothered a lot of people that wanted um, shall we say ingenuity driven out of them. So they would meet, meet their particular standard. And he was also put down and had to endure because he was shorter than the average man. And the comments that would come at him were quite shall we say put in a way that you could tell there was no love in that person when they said it. You don't judge a person by their height or their hair color or this or that. It's who are they? What's in their soul? He let um, a lot of the mockeries and mocking statements pass over him, especially from some of the churches that he has attended in the past. He was, um, rather put down. But you know, he kept a, a joy about him, even with that. He was told he was not 
worthy of getting uh, wealth or um, having job uh, status level because after all, he liked farming and being a cowboy. Yeah, he liked being, living on a farm. And so both him and Margaret were ostracized from a lot of activities because of it. And to allow your children to run barefoot, that's sacrilegious. <laughs> no one's running barefoot. <laughs> you know, some people that's just, it, it's a false standard. He was judged all the time by a false standard on things. And yet, he said, even with the demeaning criticisms that he's had over his life, he learned to forgive. And he learned to forgive because of his children and grandchildren. Um, he didn't want them under an iron fist. You know, you, they, they couldn't expand their talents on their own or be led into areas by the Holy Spirit as to what they were needed to learn for future events in life. And he never wanted to accept any of these things for his children. And many people consider that was neglect. He was uh, incompetent as the father. And they told him so. Having control was not important to him. But teaching a reliance on God was. And he taught this thing about setting priorities in his life. What's really important and what isn't? It's not important. If the children want to run outside barefoot, it's not important. No, it's not. If there's an injury, it's healable. It's curable. So you stub your toe. Is that the end of the world? Do you have to cut their head off because they stubbed their toe? No. It's just they learn how to run safely, how to walk safely, how to climb trees safely and bare feet. But it teaches them something about handling problems later in life. And he says, it was, what he wanted is to allow his children and grandchildren to experience enough of life that they could handle problems later on in life. So, when you take that, let's look at what did Norm stand up upon as values which we could learn from. Where were his values on things? Well, I had a long chat with him over the last, actually, three years. We would have little talks here and there, and it just it would add up to quite a bit. I was, uh, the first thing that he thought was most important is to keep God first and be grateful. If you can't keep God first in your life, you and be grateful for what you do have. His feeling was, you're not going to enjoy the rest of your life. And many people tried to convince him not to enjoy his life. But he says, well, he was... 
didn't know what he could do or not do, but he knew that he was, might as well be thankful for what was available. The second point is, don't block your wife's talents, anointings, or goals. He said he learned that early in the marriage, and he kept with it, and it was important. Because the stronger she became the, in the marriage with confidence and security, the stronger the marriage was. And he just knew that encouraging his wife to do good things or to stand up for what's right was going to benefit him in the end, too. And that the whole family, all the descendants. And you, you know, that's a lot of wisdom in there. He, he would sit and meditate and dwell on things like that. What was the cause and effect relationship? He would dwell on that. He didn't always talk to everybody about what he was dwelling on, but if you asked the right question, he would come up with the answer for you. Just how he asked it. You know, as long as you didn't look like you were being nosy. But you could get good answers out of him. The third point that he mentioned was love your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, as individuals regardless of the choices that they make. If you try and change them, it's not going to work. But if you love them and they know that they're loved, they will eventually turn around and see what was right and make the right choices, reverse errors that they've made. But he says condemning them and nagging them won't work. I think we can ask Charlene about that one, too. Mm -hmm. Another point that he wanted to emphasize quite strongly was that don't let tomorrow overpower today. Deal with the problems of today, today. Don't go looking for problems for tomorrow and try and deal with them today. Deal with the ones that you have. It's more than enough to look after. And, you know, there was a lot of people that would come seeking advice all the time in his life. And, you know, he says, I'm not a train counselor, I'm not this, I'm not that. He says, but they come. And it's one of the things that he always tried to get them to understand. That the anxiety they were feeling, the troubles that they were having, is because they weren't dealing with today's problems. They were trying to deal with tomorrow's problems. Or yesterday's problems that have long gone. They weren't living in today. His fifth point of, that I thought was quite interesting too, was he said, seek peace as anger and pride are not worth the pain they cause for you and for others. You know, if you're not seeking peace, you're going to have such turmoil and strife in your life. Is it worth it? Is it worth it being at war with everybody? Sixth is that make your goals worth the pain, the suffering, and the effort of getting to them. Don't make sloppy goals in your life. If your goal today is to, let's say, fix the furniture in the backyard, well, go and fix the furniture. But make sure you're fixing it because you're going to use it, not because you want to show it off to the neighbors. Make your goals right. Make your program right. Seventh is 
seven was friends and enemies can switch roles at any time. Who you think is your friend can become your enemy at a blink, just like that, and you don't even know why. And an enemy can suddenly become friendly. It all depends on how you treat them, pray for them, and forgive them. How long they stay not. Whether a friend stays with you is, you know, will depend on how you treat them. And over the years, I've seen that that is a hard lesson that people, even in the congregation of God, have refused to learn. What you sow into another person's life is what you can get back. If you're not sowing mercy, you're not sowing love, you're not sowing forgiveness, it's not going to come back to you. And you can't show yourself a friend if you're doing everything you can to be an enemy. How many here would trust the person that was constantly stealing out of their wallet or purse? Well, they were showing themselves friendly that they thought that whatever you had earned was part of theirs. Ask first. <laughs> well, what he was saying is, is that even though people will do things to you, if you don't move quickly to forgive them, you get torn <coughs> out by the pressure of trying to not forgive them. <coughs> Number eight. When you live for your past, you have no hope for a better future. Reliving your past is one thing, but repeating the speaking of it and all the pain that went along with it just neutralizes and kills all hope you have of a better future. And he said, nine out of ten people that he's met in his life lived for their past. They really lived for their past. What happened in 1814 was more important to them than what they could make happen tomorrow or the day after. That's when, and he says, they want to tear things down, not build things up when you do that. You can't build a future when you're so busy tearing people apart in your past, or tearing things apart, or events in your past. Number nine, don't lose sight of what Yeshua has done for you already or what our Father has provisioned for you, for your future. Little events, Satan will push little events at you. And you can be overwhelmed by them and forget what's been promised to you. If you just say no to those events, no. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by that. This belongs to Jesus. He said it was one of the things that he knew in his heart was correct, but it was hard to follow. But he knew it was right. He, was, you know, he had difficulty with that one. Number 10. Facts and evidence are often used to support a lie. The truth stands firm and is not shaken by emotions, deceptions, or illogical arguments. And it's amazing 
when people are supporting a lie, what illogical arguments they can suddenly develop for you to listen to. And he says, the more wrong a person is, he says, the, in what they're doing, the more illogical their arguments become. When you sit back, you will repeat something, well, I had this and this happen, you know, I, I'm justified in this thinking or doing this. He says, no. You don't cut the hands off your children because they spill milk. You don't cut another person's hands off because they spilled some milk. And you don't kill your dog because it caught a rabbit. So, there are things that are natural, that are events that just happen. Don't get worried up over them. Eleven, he says, be kind so others can be kind to you. And he, this one, again, was kind of hard because he says, some people, no matter how kind you are to them, all they want to do is attack and destroy you. And they don't know why. They don't have any logic behind it. They just want to attack and destroy you. And the twelfth point that was important, that he, he says, flattery, gossip, and condemnation will always sadden the soul and bring misery, malcontentment, and oppression. So, if you decide you're going to listen to flattery or you're seeking flattery, or you listen to gossip, or you listen to someone being condemned by another. It wounds your soul. It saddens it. It changes the positive life energy into a negative life energy. And it brings misery and malcontentment and oppression to you to the person you were talking about or heard things talked about and to the person that did the talking that you listened to. And he said, it's very hard to get across to people that what they're saying is hurtful and that they don't want to listen to it. Certain people will insist on venting and ranting, regardless of what the evidence drew, the ev you know, whatever the word of God says, that they are going to vent and rant. And he says it does make everybody sick and sad. Norm had lessons to teach and always well, he wondered why so few would listen. You know, he, he, he would try and give a piece of information, but he didn't want to come as a derogatory, or to, so he would skirt into it and around it to, to try and explain it. And if you gathered his 12 points, you could say, in his memory, can you, can you listen now to them, of what, what he stood for as a person? Can you listen to them now? He never said his life was easy, he never said he had everything that could be spent on, on the mark. When we had asked Norm what he wanted to be remembered for, what do you think he responded? He wanted to be 
remembered that he was a loving man that wanted the best that Jesus could provide for his family and his friends. That was number one on the list. Is it number one on yours? Or is it what can God provide for me? What new thing is he, is he providing for me? The second point is that because of Scott's teaching, he was able to forgive even when it hurt. He, he learned how to forgive. And he would want people to learn how to forgive. Get the grace of God to forgive. And the third point he made was he always sought to make things better than he found them even when it was very painful or costly to do. He was a builder, he not a destroyer. He wanted to build, he wanted things, he wanted to see things better for everybody. And, you know, a lot of people thought he was useless because of that. Just, not into it. And when he was asked what message he would leave for those who survived him, he said, find the real Jesus, obey the real Jesus, and be blessed as a peacemaker. He said, if you're going to do anything in life, you know, that's the most important thing. And he says, with all my love and hope, I pray this for everyone that hears it. So, this is the memory we have of a God-respecting man. So my dad was born in England in 1928, on February 1st, and he was the youngest son of his parents, and he had a big brother, well, two big brothers, and so he was born in 1928, but when he was two years old, his mother was in a sidecar with his dad and his Aunt May and Uncle John, and a drunk driver hit them and killed his mother. So he was about two years old when he lost his mother, so he didn't really know her. But his father remarried her best friend. And, or remarried, but married her best friend. And then they had a daughter, uh, his little sister, Auntie Kath, and he thought the world of her. She has six children, and all those children live in England. And uh, so we've been able to communicate back and forth and keep in touch with them through Facebook, which... He really enjoyed, and they really enjoyed, and we've been able to share pictures. And the two oldest are twins, and they came over to visit in 2006 and had a beautiful time with Mom and Dad, and that was one of many awesome memories. And uh, so he, he was in England until, well, about 14 years old is when you leave school there if you don't go on to school. So he had two aunties, his Aunt May was one, and then his Auntie Maud. And he went to stay with Auntie Maud and Uncle, jo uh, Uncle Robert. And they really taught him like who he is, like who he was and his character and stuff. I asked him just recently in the last few weeks, you know, how much influence did they have on your life? And he said, well, Aunt Maud had an amazing amount of influence and so did Uncle Robert. And that's where his respect for people came from. Aunt Maud taught him to really respect people. You didn't worry about what the neighbors were doing or not doing. You, you know, one of the things my dad always said, he, he knows this lady who's, who's very uh, fond of my dad. Uh, but, you know, he, he said, we sit there and have coffee, and she has to look out the window and wonder why the neighbor's going down the road because he went down this morning. And that would just annoy him. <laughs> He'd laugh at it, but it just annoyed him. He, did, he didn't have time for that. So his Aunt Ma taught him those kinds of things, and he stayed there for quite a few years he worked there and hold sugar beets and a few other things. 
And then, when he was about 25 years old, he said he got wanderlust and he had to go to Canada. He wanted to go to Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand was always where he wanted to go. I said, oh, wouldn't you want to go to Hawaii? He said, not in your life. I go to New Zealand. So he always wanted to go to Australia and New Zealand, but he never got there. But he did get to Canada. And when he came over in about 1953, 54, he landed, they took the boat, right? And you'd see all the dolphins and everything. And he ended up in Nova Scotia. Worked there for a while, went into Ontario, got to Sault Ste. Marie and said, if this is Canada, I'm going home. <laughs> Didn't like it. And, uh, but he came for the Calgary Stampede. And so he had to see the Calgary Stampede before he went home. And when he got to Alberta, he said, I'm home. I don't need to go anywhere. And so he worked in Okotoks, uh, down there on a farm, and got to know a family there that we still know today. And uh, the lady that he worked for, we call her Grandma Lucy, and they were just buddies, just buddies. They thought the same. They didn't worry about when they got up or when they went to bed or who did what or what the neighbors thought. Exactly the same thing. You just lived your life and you were productive and you enjoyed the simple things in life as well. And so that's why we brought these flowers today, and that's why you have fireweed, and Alberta Rose was his favorite flower. And he didn't like any flowers that were patted on the head. Like these ones over here that were from the florist, they were patted on the head. I didn't like those. <laughs> but um, he liked the flowers, and when you walked through the field, you didn't step on the flowers. And I said, but Dad, there's a whole bunch. And he goes, you don't step on the flowers. So you just don't step on the flowers. So he liked all those kinds of things, and wildflowers and things like that. And he, uh, he farmed there and, well, worked for those people because when you came over, you had to work for somebody, right? And you had, he was on that kind of a visa. So he worked for those people and made a lot of friends, a lot of friends, and he built seed cleaning plants and uh, grain elevators. And there was a man in... Old, who's very happy that my dad had this little brownie camera and took lots of pictures because he looked, took lots of pictures from the top of that grain elevator. And he's so excited because he runs the Historical Society in Old. <laughs> His name's Jeremy. And he goes, I knew the blacksmith shop was there. He was so excited because all these pictures we took down, about 21 pictures to him a few years ago. And he just thought that was so good. So that was one of the last. Um, wood elevators to be built actually. It was in about 1958-59 in Olds because then they went to concrete and they went on from there. But he slept in the back of his truck and it made a little canopy and then the man who ran the job contracted out a lady to make their meals for them. And all along all these little journeys he learned two things he would never ever do or ever have in his household. One, bologna and two, margarine. So we never had bologna and we never had margin. <laughs> he said, I eat enough of that stuff, I'm never eating it again. And he never did. <laughs> so those are the two things that he learned along the way. But uh, that's when he started to go to the square dances and met a lot of people and had a lot of friends. And him and mom had, and dad, they had tons of friends. And their friends were the mayor of Calgary and their friends were... The motorcycle guys that lived down in Bonas and, you know, their children ran wild and everybody thought they were crazy, you know. But mom and dad had those kinds of friends. And uh, my dad has lifelong friends. Actually, one of his friends that I phoned to tell him about his passing is Roy. And Roy and his brothers were riding motorbikes with dad and his brothers, <laughs> you know, in the 40s and things like that. So uh, he lives in Calgary, Roy lives in Calgary. and long-time friends, and always good friends, always could, could phone each other up and have a chat, and, and then he has other friends as well that I had to phone. But they would always just keep in contact with one another and see each other, and there was none of this, well, you haven't phoned me, and all the pettiness and garbage that people get into today is disgusting. Anyway, so, <laughs> so then mom and dad, they lived in Calgary for a while, and... Uh, well, I was born, and then they had two children that were born at um, nine months that died. And so they adopted my brother. And then we moved to, my dad bought a farm in Valley View, up in the Sunset House. So we lived in the sticks for about six years, seven years, and he had, we really wanted to farm. It didn't work out, and he was very, that was a very big disappointment in his life. Uh, and he so enjoyed 
farming. We had a lot of sheep and goats and cows and chickens and all those kinds of things. And one of the things that he was a very gentle, kind person, but he could be a man. And when the dog that was really cute was going to bother the livestock, he had no problem taking it out back and shooting it. Now, it didn't mean he didn't cry and you had to stay away from him for a while, but he did what he had to do as well. He didn't have any problem with that. So, you know, there might be a dead coyote or something, and as a girl, if you went, ew, or anything, that, no, no, don't be silly, right? Don't need to be doing that. And, you know, I, because my brother's six years younger than me, you had to hang on to the board when you decided to saw it. You'd be vibrating because you're six or seven years old, and you're just like, Ugh. it feels weird. Shut up and hold on to the board. <laughs> And if you needed to do something, you needed to do something, you know. Okay, well, there's the string, there's the... It wouldn't give me nails, because he figured I'd leave them all over the place, and the animals would step on them. But, you know, there's the rope, and there's the boards, and there's all the stuff. Go build it. Whatever you want to build, go build. And that's just the way it was. As far as the bare feet, yes, we could run down the gravel road, right, in your bare feet. That was an accomplishment. And my brother, yes, he went outside at minus 40 in his bare feet. <laughs> and no, he didn't get pneumonia. So all those kinds of things didn't really bother him. Then we, uh, he decided he still wanted to stay on a farm, but he didn't have his farm. So he, we went off to England in 1974, and it was so interesting because the people there, you know, my dad, Stuart's his son, right? And so they came up to, they went out to the pub one night and they said, Norm, you'll never, you'll never be dead as long as your son Stuart's alive. And my brother was about six at the time. So I thought that was really, really interesting. And my dad was pretty thrilled about that because obviously Stuart had picked up a lot of his, uh, the way he stood and the way he did things and the way he said things. And he was only six. So I thought that was pretty neat. So we went back there and had to take pictures of us. And when dad went back, uh, he'd been in Canada about a year. And of course, got the cowboy thing. Horses never liked him, by the way. <laughs> so, he was a, he was a, a true Brit British cowboy. Horses didn't like him. But he had all the gear and the get up. And he went back a year after he'd been here and knocked on the door of his mom's house. And she just about fainted because this dude was standing at her door and she didn't have a clue who he was. So anyway, he hit the papers. He was at Heathrow Airport and. And uh, the London Daily Mail photographer was there and took pictures of him. And uh, the policeman said, you're not supposed to be here, but I'll shake your hand because I've never met a real cowboy before. <laughs> so he had lots of fun with, with that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, in about 1976, he wanted to stay on the farm. And so he started milking cows for different dairy farmers. And this is where I really learned that they, they liked to just take advantage of him. And there was one man, uh, Mr. Ginther, who didn't. And my dad had the opportunity to work for him for about a year. And that man was absolutely amazing. He was another man like my dad. And just a beautiful, kind, loving person. And so that he was refreshing. But the other ones, my mom was always worried that dad was going to get hurt because they wouldn't fix things or, you know, their animals were out of control. But because it's dad, what do they care? But mom would be like, yeah, you get hurt, where do we go, right? But my dad never stole from them. He always did an honest day's work and more. And he always left and made sure that it was better than when he came. And I know that when we prayed for my brother to have a job, the prayer was, yes, you know, a lot of guys can go, oh, I know Joe, I know this, and they get their son's jobs, right? But my dad couldn't do that. But we said to God, because of my dad's work ethic and because of his character, we'd like you to find him a job. And my brother has, from that day on, been well taken care of and on, on that matter, right? So then my dad and mom, it got to the point um, where dad said he didn't want to work for farmers anymore and have to deal with the cows and getting up and just, you know, the 4.30 mornings and things. So he started... It was when 1981 when the economy was really bad. So anyway, he started working at uh, fixing hotels, and that took them to Banff. So my brother had the opportunity of living in Banff when he was in high school. So he skied, he cross-country skied, he did every sport there was. 
he, you know, we got to go to the Dan Springs Hotel for his graduation. And mom and dad enjoyed their time there because there was a lot of really neat things that Stuart got to do and, and what they got to do. And they lived at the base of Mount Norquay at the hotel. So you could hear the uh, mountain goats slamming their heads together, the mountain sheep, right, fighting with each other, bang, and echoing through the, through the valley. So they had lots of really, really neat uh, times there. And met a lot of people, got to do a lot of things, were given a lot of things, and, and were able to do some holidays and things because of it. So they really liked that. And then in their 25th wedding anniversary came up, and they were there. And we were able to have a 25th wedding anniversary party for them. And there was about 350 people there. All my mom's relatives and their friends and friends from Vancouver managed to all come. And I think that's why I always tell people to celebrate when you can celebrate. Because those are the times that you look back on and they're just so comforting. That's the time to do them. You know, when you're 88 years old, you've probably li outlived most of your friends and relatives, right? So, you know... Don't bother then. But at 25 years, that was awesome, and they had a really big party, and it was it was it was really great. And that's when I saw how much people respected them for how much they just gave to people, and they didn't judge other people. And then they came to Edmonton. They ended up living with us for a little while, and had a farm that they lived on out at um, out by New Sarepta, just off Rollyview Road. And that was a beautiful farm, and Dad really and Mom really enjoyed that. All the birds, and that you got to have bantam chickens, and we had hay rides and stuff at Thanksgiving. And those are some of the times that both my brother Stuart and Martin Bishop really, really enjoyed. They really enjoyed those times, and that's where you know Grandma and Grandpa or Mom and Dad jumped in the leaves and did all these things that they didn't see them normally do, and that was really, really encouraging. And then the last house they lived at was in Kalmar. And people in Kalmar still say, oh, we really would like if Norman Mark lived there because that yard is just so ugly now. Because <laughs> their yard was always so pretty and full of flowers and they liked them. And at that time, my dad had a whole bunch of redemption happen. He started coming to services here. And he met, my dad always liked to encourage people. So there was a new business in town. It was a restaurant, it was called Brico. So he started poking around to see what the new people were doing and encouraged them. And he found out that it was a young man that was starting this restaurant, Kirk. So he started encouraging Kirk. And, he, and then he, Kirk would say, yeah, I need this fixed. So Dad would just go fix it. He didn't get paid for it. He didn't want to get paid for it. He was just encouraging people who were coming to his town. And so Kirk says he just kept hanging around and he kept doing things for me. And he said, I found a friend. And here Kirk was in his, well, Dad would have been about 75. And Kirk was in his 30s, maybe, early 30s. And so he says, I found this friend. And pretty soon, they found out they both liked driftwood. And so they would go up and down the river looking for driftwood out at Kirk's place. And then Kirk would have an art show because he would just paint on wood. And he would sell these things for like $100, $200, $300, right? And he'd say to Dad, your stuff's good. Put a better price on it. And you just boost Dad up, right? They were the best of friends. Well, my dad got dessert all the time. He never got dessert at home, ever. <laughs> he had dessert maybe five times in his whole life, I think. But there he had dessert all the time. And Kirk would keep the best meat and cook him the best meat, the best lamb or steak. He had gourmet meals for quite a few years there and lots of desserts. And he even got to be part of a presentation about his own chef's hat, chef's coat, and a presentation down at the Shaw with Kirk as he was doing his business. And Dad got to be a part of all that presentation and do that stuff. And he served tables, and he made salads, and he did dishes. And it was absolutely wonderful. A lot of redemption at that time. It was amazing. So the last basic place where Dad stopped was the Gold Ring Manor. And the Gold Ring Manor, that was so interesting. Because all he said the people do is run down their grandchildren. They all run down their grandchildren. They all complain about their health. And they all talk about yesterday. And one day he phoned me up and he said, get me out of here. And I'm like, but Dad, I can't. I'm, 
I have this youth event, it's a youth dance, it's like grade sevens to grade nines, we're over, get me out of here. I said, but you're having a barbecue. I don't want to stay for this barbecue. I said, okay. So I pick him up and I said, you know you have to go to the youth dance. He goes, yep. And you're okay with that? Absolutely. So he literally sat in the lobby of the, of the arena and the dance was going on, like the music's blaring, but at least they kept the doors closed. We could speak in, in the other area. And he sat there the entire evening and watched these youth, and it was his favorite thing to do. He said it was fabulous, and he was telling me all about the youth and what they were doing, and he said, I'm so glad that I came. And they all thought it was so neat that he was there, so it all worked out. But he really didn't like that. Well, of course, a lot of the men that were in there, um, see, this week, what my brother and I both came to the conclusion, it was differently, but on our own, was my dad respected women. And so all of my friends, all my daughter's friends, um, they really, really loved my dad and always wanted to be around him. Well, the women at the Gold Ring Manor liked my dad because he respected women. And they had to have coffee with a bunch of pigs. <laughs> And who treated them like trash? And, and I was there, and they would say certain things to the women. And I would say, oh, you don't have to do that. Just tell him this, that, or the other. I just tell him, right? And they'd say, right, Charlene. I said, yeah, don't make him coffee. Make your own coffee, you know? So, but Dad always would make the coffee with the ladies. He'd always go down, put the coffee on. And he was always a gentleman, so they always wanted to be around him. So we had some jealousy happening because Norm not only was kind and gentle and the women liked him, he had lots of hair. <laughs> and uh, so I said, to, the nurses would always come in, because Dad was in the hospital for two and a half months, and he went in April 16th, and the nurses would come in, and they always touch his hair because it's so soft. Oh, Norm, you have hair. Finally, he was getting enough of it. He goes, that's enough. Like, he was irritated with everybody talking about his hair. But you have hair. And he's like, I don't care that I have hair. He wanted help. He wanted to get out of there. He wanted healing. He didn't care about his hair. But anyway, that's, that's kind of how it went. He just didn't care about those silly things, what people wore, what they did or they didn't do. He just didn't care, didn't want to know. That's not what it was about. And there was a man that they actually bullied. You know, you can get that old and still be bullying people. Oh, I don't know. Don't learn, I guess. And, uh, but Dad was friends with that man. And always made sure that that man felt welcome and uh, kept his friendship. He was quiet about what he did. He knew that there were certain people you couldn't talk to and say things to, and that's just the way it was, right? So, uh, anyway, what he did say every day when I left, he says, make sure you tell the children I love them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Norm, <laughs> we knew Norm, oh, I don't know when you first, we first met in Worldwide. Uh, but Charlene and our oldest daughter always used to be best friends. And, of course, Norm and Margaret were from the country. And country people just have a down-to-earth um, attitude about them. They, they, don't, they don't care about what clothes people... Just like it's been said, clothes aren't important, hair isn't important, shoes aren't... Like, you know, you just, you're just glad to be out in the country into the wide open spaces and... and the birds and the trees and the stars at night and all these things, when you see God's creation around you, you don't worry about the piddly little things, whether you have your false, whether your false fingernails uh, have a chip in them or, or F, F um, you know what I'm saying. Like, it's just, and country people, um, it's that down-to-earth thing. And I know Hobby would often say, he would meet different of my friends because, as you know, he never, never came to church with me. Um, and and he, he used to go to, to uh, events in the uh, worldwide, and he'd come home and he'd say, well, this guy, he liked him, but this guy, no. And, you know, he had his attitude, well, his not attitudes, but, you know, his opinions. But country people always were the ones that... Touched my heart, and and probably hobbies too, but but Norm and Margaret were always always open and friendly and kind, and 
They're just who they are. They don't apologize for who they are because none of us are perfect. None of us, we all make mistakes. We all have our likes. We all have our dislikes. But some people that, sometimes um, people will try to put on a show or, um, uh, you, you know what I'm saying. Norm was never like that. He was who he was. He was proud of who he was. And he, that's who he was. And if you don't like it, well, then that's your problem. It's not my problem. You know, and he always had that, that uh, happy... I always remember him as being joyful when Gerald mentioned about him having a lot of trials. I never heard about a lot of his trials because even though, like, you only seen them at church once a week, but he, he was always happy. And I remember here, he always would... Uh, you know, he always had a hug for me, and and we don't usually chat a little bit, and and it was always something uplifting, and and uh, regardless of how he felt, he still had a had a, 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 a that spirit in his heart that lifted you up and made you feel that you were important. He wasn't concerned about how he was feeling, but how 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 are you doing? And and he always he always again loved the children, and the grandchildren would be around him, and. And uh, even at uh, the, the parties that we were at, um, you know, he'd be, I don't remember if he was up dancing at that one party we had or not that I was at, we were at. Uh, but, you know, he, they'd have the music and everybody would be uh, participating. And, and he was happy that others were happy. He, he had a, a, a special uh, love in his heart for other people. And, and he wasn't busy judging them and doing what some people do, but he was busy just enjoying them, enjoying who they were, and happy, happy for who he was, and and um, he just he was who he was, and and uh, here we can remember him always being thankful for what he had. I know I still use still every morning when I'm home. Well, not every morning, but especially in the winter. For a feast gift one year, he gave me a big bushy black blanket, <laughs> and Joyce Thompson got one, and she took. Uh, we had our choice. I guess I took the. Uh, I don't even know who chose first, but she, uh, he told us to take our pick, and I got the black one, and Joyce got the brown one, and uh, and you know he always thought about others, and and uh, was very appreciative of what a lot of us did within the the body here. Um, that you know he well the. Uh, he did what he could, and we all do what we can. So, so Norm was always uh, willing to uh, uh, contribute, and I remember different, many times there would be that those big bricks of cheese that Norm used to like to <laughs> contribute to our to our meals that we have here, and and he just was always very giving, very thoughtful, and uh, he loved Jesus, and Jesus loved him. Well, I don't have a whole lot to say, but uh, I've known Norm for uh, better for the last 10, 12 years or so. He started coming here, but I probably saw him before and worldwide, but uh, I was probably too little to remember. But uh, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed with Norm was a sense of humor. We could laugh and joke back and forth, and he, he understood my sense of humor, and I could probably joke with him on certain things that I couldn't joke with anyone else about, but... Uh, uh, something that comes to mind is one time I had to found on YouTube the swearing song, and <laughs> well, it, it was pretty funny. It's actually pretty clean, but it's it's funny, and he just both fell off his chair laughing at that, and a couple other things we talked about. He was uh, just a real real joy to be around, and I appreciated him for that, and I look forward to joking with him when we get to see him again. So, so uh, yeah. That's what I have. Maybe we'll share the swearing song with everybody else later, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I just went to have that little My thing. words for Norm will be short and sweet, like Norm was. Short and sweet, as you said. <laughs> and uh, the words that come to me, I, I can't think of the words. That, I'm just amazed at the anointing on an apostle of judgment. He sums up everything with all these points. That we can always learn from Norm in this way, but what I will say would be very simple. It's actually W H H. Whoo! <laughs> That's my summary of, of his life: wisdom, humility, and humor.
and lots of humor. It's one time we can say he died laughing. <laughs> he did. He died laughing because he had that sense of humor. And I loved, I liked rather, to hear his quips. Sometimes I couldn't hear them as well as I liked to far away from Norm, but he always had good quips. Yeah. A good, good word that were just, just pithy, just exactly what you like to hear. And it was a blessing to have that sense of humor. As Gerald said, he had joy. That joy, and he did laugh. He liked to laugh. He made people laugh. He added joy to our lives. And we pray that we can also add joy to each other. I really... Okay, so um, it's like it's coming in waves for me. Like, dang it, I was so good. No. <laughs> but like, the one thing... That's kept me like pretty not upset for the most part is what Grandpa said when he was still here and he would always say goodbye for now. <laughs>